Uh, thank you guys for joining our second uh, installation of the Bull Seminar Series with us in this fall semester. Um, I'm really excited to welcome our newest uh, boundary layer related faculty member, uh, Octavio Acevedo. Uh, Octavio joins us um, from Brazil. Uh, he comes from the Santa Maria University um, and he earned his PhD um, from the University of Albany. Um, and he's had many, many experiences. I'm not going to go into a long, long bio. <laughs> um, he's uh, a mid-career faculty, so it's it's long in story. Um, he has a great um, a bibliography I encourage you to go take a look at as well. He is um, featured on our Boundary Layer website. That's bliss.science. So you can go take a look at that for yourself as well. Um, so I do encourage you to take a look at that, get to know some of the experience that he has. Um, something kind of new that he does bring back to us now um, is expertise in towers measurement, uh, specifically a lot of the work that he's done at the Amazon forest. So we're excited to bring that to us as well. So without further ado, I welcome Octavia to our seminar series. I'm excited to see what you'll talk to us about. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice welcome. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. And the, the idea for the seminar today is to, uh, so you pretty much, the, the biggest reason is so I can show you what I've been doing and more important than that, the ideas that I have, the ideas that I bring to you and things that I think we can do together here. That's the, the main idea. And uh, I'd like to show my ideas to you and certainly I'd like to, hear the feedback from from you and see 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 where it can go from here um the the title of the seminar that i gave to elizabeth with this this one might be a little misleading because um yeah i'm gonna mention that i'm gonna talk about turbulence regimes but i'm not gonna talk only on that and because i'm looking for uh the ideas of future work, and I have a much more solid idea on the stable side. I'll talk more for the stable boundary, which is more related to what I, I've done in my career. But I also mentioned some ideas and some that talk to some previous work we've done in the convective boundary layer as well. So I'll start with the stable boundary layer. And one thing that I, I'd like to uh, you to have an idea that's, is that uh, uh, um, one thing that I think that matters is the idea of predictability. And I think that's something that interests the community here at OU. So based on the idea, on looking for predictability of variables at night in the stable boundary layer, first question I ask, very basic, is there a specific difficulty for understanding and forecasting the weather at night as opposed to during the day. I'm sure many of you are, might be thinking of different things, but I want to highlight this one. And to do that, uh, I, I'm showing data from this experiment we, we ran in Brazil. It was in Southern Brazil in 2013, these measurements. And it's in an, in an area you can see here, it's a little more than one kilometer in the east-west direction. and about half a kilometer, 500 meters in north-south direction. And here we have, in terms of, of height, we had uh, 10 weather stations deployed along the area. In terms of height, the highest one, which is this one here, it's about 300, I'm not sure if you can see, probably can see 390 meters height. And the lowest would be these two, about 340 meters height. So it's no, it, it's it's actually the difference is about 30 meters from the lowest to the highest. And you can see in this night here, this this is the main point. This is a size of much smaller than any operational model grid cell. It's it's 500 by, by one 500 meters by one kilometer. And how do you forecast a variable that if you look at the temperature here in this? small small domain here the the temperature varied in this night here from the highest temperature to also this highest station to the lowest temperature which is this one one of the lowest stations 
it got to be 12 degrees Celsius of difference. And you can see that in the daytime, daytime is fine. If you, if you take this area as a grid cell, it's, there is a little bit of variability in temperature, but it's fine. Again, you might think, okay, that, but that's, so what's the big deal? You can kind of have an idea what will be colder, what will be warmer. Yeah, maybe. Usually the lowest stations are colder, except that if you see these two, uh, these two stations here, they are at the same height, and there was a three to four degrees difference, and this is because the coldest one is more protected by trees and so on that obstruct the wind here that causes this difference. But anyway, you can have an idea. But the point is, to look at three days after, this is 1st of August, this is 4th of August, we had a night that started pretty much at the same place, 25 degrees, the same height. But then all the stations went together. What's the difference between the two? That, that's the wind. It's like in this case here, I, I use, usually I see this in classroom, it's like some somebody has a spoon and steering the the boundary layer and in this case no in this case every every place goes everywhere but the question is when does it behave like this when does it behave like this is that predictable uh, the wind speed has a has a control from the same data set you can see that uh, in the average, as the wind speed goes on, uh, increases, the different stations go to a similar place in terms of temperature. In the limit, they are very close together in the, limit, in the, high, wi uh, uh, the high wind limit. And then there is, seems to be a, some sort of threshold for each wind speed threshold for each station, which triggers they join in the network. So the wind speed has a control. And another thing, this is for my for my thesis, doctorate thesis in 2001 in Albany, it's abrupt. Uh, here, comparing only three stations in a different network here, you can see that a little bit of wind brings the temperature many degrees up towards exactly the same value of the windy stations that are being mixed by turbulence. So we have a control by wind speed, and it is an abrupt control. Uh, this leads to the idea of uh, turbulence regimes. This is some, just some historic background, and because it's, I think it's kind of interesting. This is the classical Richardson 1920 uh, paper from which the, the Richardson number is, is derived. But uh, I, you can see it in, in this one here, but I think you can see even better from these anemographic registers in, in this other paper here from 1933. You can see clearly the anemographic records that turbulence at, at, at some point turbulence dies out. This is when you look at temperature here. I think it's better for, to, to look there for me than here. If you look at temperature here, when turbulence dies out, it goes goes off, it, it's because you see the, the mixing, it starts no, no longer bringing warmer air from above. Any place will go to, to the locally dependent uh, features. More recently, the idea of two regimes uh, has been better established. There is this very famous paper, Andre and Martin, 1982, where they established the idea of uh, that the stable boundary layer can be either radiative or turbulent, depending on the type of cooling that dominates. If it's dominated by radiative cooling, you have a very sharp gradient near the surface, but also restricted to a much shallower layer. If you have enough turbulence, the turbulence will be able to, say, a sort of mix over a deeper layer. So you have a stable boundary layer that's thicker, but not as stable. More recently, the idea uh, the, 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 for the two regimes has been established as either very stable or weakly stable boundary layer. And I think, uh, at least as far as I know, the first time that the, these uh, terms are used is in this paper by Mark, 1998. And uh, back then, they were using the idea that 
when the heat flux increases with stability, because we're increasing the gradient, so increasing the gradient, increase the heat flux, uh, then it's the weakly stable regime. But then there, at some point, you increase so much stability that you decrease the mixing, and then the heat flux starts decreasing. When Matt first introduced this, he, he suggested a transition regime and then the very stable regime right in the end. Some people, and myself among them, have used the idea that this first part would be weakly stable and this second part very stable. But I don't, I don't think this is correct anymore. Uh, we have observations that sh show that the, the maximum heat flux is not connected to the regime transition. The regime transition. Maybe this uh, here that Mark Mar suggests for the uh, transition between, transi uh, between transition and very stable would be more like. To, but we we also because the, transi the transition, as we saw, is abrupt. I don't really believe there is a transitional regime. But this is subject to to question. Okay, then there is the paper by Jay Lun Sun in uh, 2012, where the, 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 it's the famous hockey stick, where it's a relationship between uh, turbulence here, given by the square root of the turbulent kinetic energy and the wind speed. The, what uh, they show there is that turbulence increase a little bit with the wind speed up to a threshold, and then starts to increasing more steadily. And this threshold would mark the, the regime transition. A little after that, uh, we published this paper where we showed that if we compare not the TKE at a given level to that to the wind speed at the same level, but TKE at a given level to the wind speed at a reference level, you can see this inversion of the, the TKE gradient very sharply at the transition. Uh, which means that in the very stable regime, TK increases with height, contrary to any definitions of turbulence being generated at the surface. And in the weakly stable regime, then you have more the more classical boundary layer with turbulence being generated at the surface and decreasing with height. At this data set here, this is from the floss, uh, it's extremely precise, happens, uh, you can use this method to define it very precisely. And we find, found that it, it, it is like that in many places too, but not always. There are places that don't show that because these are places where you do not have enough activity in the very stable regime that increase with height. This would be non-turbulence, non-turbulent fluctuations, with what Larry might call a sub -meso. So. To make this distinction more clear, uh, uh, just doing this table to summarize and to, to have these ideas more, more clearly stated. So there are two regimes, very distinct characteristics. I, I, I'm the classical, the formal definition is weakly stable and very stable. Some some people use. I I, I really have to say I like. I think uh, whatever is sim simpler, I like. But, just saying strong wind or weak wind regime, but not many people agree because it's it's relatively strong and relatively weak. But anyway, strong wind or weakly stable, weak wind or very stable. What happens with different variables? The temperature in the weakly stable is warmer, in the very stable is colder because of not uh, not enough mixing. Turbulence is continuous, sustainable. That's what that's a, a word that people have been using to refer to turbulence in the weekly stable. It means that it, it the mechanisms that generate turbulence are continuous through the night, so it's sustainable. While in the weak wind, it's typically intermittent, possibly absent. So it's never really absent, really absolutely absent. There's always some degree of turbulent mixing, but for all practical purposes, at some dire conditions, that you can say it's absent. Scalar concentration low in the strong wind because it's mixed, high in the weak wind. Wind direction is consistent. It doesn't mean I use consistent here not because it's not obviously constant. There is some variation, but it's a variation I'll, uh, uh, with respect to a to a preferential wind direction. Why we, uh, in the very stable, it can go anywhere. 
uh, giving, uh, which is the phenomenon that people call as meandering. In meandering, if you, if you see a series of meandering, in a few hours, the, the, the wind speed will go in the four quad quadrants. Um, obviously, very weak wind speeds. As we saw, the horizontal variability is very small in the strong wind case, very large in the weak wind, depending on the site, obviously. And the predictability, the, the weakly stable regime is, pred is predictable. Uh, similarity relationships work well, they are established from that. The predictability is very low in the, as I will show, in the very stable regime. It affects minimum temperature, affects frost, affects fog formation, affects air quality, and others, of course. I was actually happy to see this weekend, um, Petra and Elizabeth told me to download the, the radar scope. Uh, uh, and I, I saw, I think Saturday, there was an alert for a fog alert. So I said, oh, yes, we also have our, <laughs> our, uh, our, our science is, is, is here, too. Yeah, so understanding the, the atmosphere near the surface at night demands to understand what controls this, the two regimes. First thing, what causes, why, why are there two regimes? That's probably what... Why is there such a, uh, what happens that uh, causes an abrupt transition that everything goes different or most of the, of the variables go very different from one case to the other? I think this is kind of well, well established now, right now. Very stable regime, the, the one that uh, uh, we, uh, happens with weak, weak winds, happens when the wind is, is not large enough to drive a turbulence flux that returns to the surface the energy that's lost by radiation. You, you have in the in stable wonder layer, you lose energy by radiation from the surface. If you have enough wind, it might drive turbulence flux that will return not, in to, not all the energy to the surface, but consistently or sustainably return this energy to the surface. But if you do not, well, then the surface will keep cooling. The surface will keep cooling for the entire, uh, uh, and uh, leading to a local equilibrium. However, there are things that are not well understood, especially in the very stable regime. And this is something uh, uh, Elizabeth introduced me. Uh, uh, I come from the University of Santa Maria. In, that's where I was. I worked for 20 years before I came here. Um, Santa Maria is in southern Brazil. When you think of Brazil, you usually think of Rio, Sao Paulo, or the Amazon. I mean, southern Brazil, very close to, to Uruguay and Argentina, which is also the hotspot for severe weathering in, in South America. And we do have a, a severe weather group there. Uh, you, Many of you might remember Mauricio, Mauricio Oliveira, who was here until two years ago. He was uh, was my student in, uh, in the undergrad. Then Mauricio's advisor, Hernani, did his PhD here about the same time I was in Albany. He, I know him from way before that. So, of course, they have a severe weather group there. And we work on this. So we have the serene weather group there. That's, so that's what I'm trying to introduce here, serene weather meteorology. Uh, and, but, uh, but as you, you will see, I think serene weather has a lot to do with severe weather at some point. I'll, I'll try to make this case in the end. Um, forecasting is an issue, as I told you. I, I, I don't want to starting to be afraid of my time here. So I, I don't want to go into much detail, but this is a plot from, the, from a paper from a former student of mine. Uh, he, he, he ran uh, WORF with different, uh, um, different boundary layer schemes, typical uh, classical boundary layer schemes from WORF, and compared the temperatures, minimum temperatures for 27 stations in our state. And, to understand what causes the error in minimum temperature. And it's very interesting that the error in minimum temperature is a very well-behaved function of 
wind speed. So if, if you have low wind speeds, all schemes, some more than others, tend to overestimate minimum temperature. If you have uh, intense, more, more strong winds, they underestimate temperature. Now, wh why is that? Based on what I just said, you just expect in the, I said, strong wind regime is more predictable. You'd expect it, it, to, it, it to tend to, to zero here, right? It, prob it makes sense to overestimate in weak wind because if you're, not, you, if you're not solving well the very stable boundary layer, usually you are saying that there is more turbulence than really there is then you, you usually say that it will be warmer than it is when it's weak wind. It makes sense this, but why doesn't, doesn't it tend to, to zero here? I do not know the answer. I, I have a, an idea though. The, the same student when he was an undergrad, he, he did a similar study with uh, RAMS, or a, a Brazilian version of RAMS, which we call PRAMS. Uh, and in that uh, study, it, uh, it, it, it had much larger errors, uh, overestimations under weak winds, and it did tend to zero. I have the impression that somehow in WORF, they pull everything to, so that in the average, the forecast is not that bad. But it overestimates in one, in one side, and underestimates the other. I do not know how, they, how that would be done, but uh, it, it may be a guess. You see that wind speed is well, the one-to-one line is here. The wind speed is well predicted for strong winds, and then for weak winds, you'd not, you'd not get it right. Same as turbulence. Turbulence, it, it, it would need to go to zero under zero winds, but it goes to a finite value here, which is exactly the problem. So some relevant research questions. Uh, how does regime transition vary between places? So think of the Jay Lunson's results. Uh, there is a very sharp tr uh, regime transition. After that, there are tens of observations at 10 different places. All of them show the same result, but each of them shows the transition happening at a different, the, the threshold wind speed is different for each other. So how do you find, how do you know what's the, the threshold wind speed in each of them? Second, does it vary at the same place as well? In a given place, can you have in one night transition happening at two meters per second and the next night happening at three meters per second? Yes, you can. So, and so what controls it? And can we find external controls? What I mean by external controls, usually the description of the stable boundary layer and R of the boundary layer itself is in terms of um, dimensionless parameters such as Z over L, Richardson number, which are defined in terms of the same variables that they are, are trying to be predicted. I have no problems with that, but if we have a problem in defining, say, the heat flux in very stable conditions, it means that this, the very variable that we are using to define whether it's very stable or not, which depends on the heat flux, might be affected by that problem. So can we, uh, the question is, can we find external controls, either in terms, what, what, what would be the external controls? Large scale wind speed, uh, uh, cloud cover, surface, uh, surface thermal properties, um, roughness, this is what I'm calling external controls. There are not variables that are dependent on the boundary layer, of, dynamical variables of the boundary layer itself. And this, uh, I'm gonna... Oh. Oh. I had a picture of the power here. It didn't come out. So, well... Uh, since uh, I, I'm going to show very briefly this paper here that was published in 2021, where we look at these external controls on transition between stable boundary layer turbulence regimes. To do that, we are going to look at the data from this tower that we have. St it still operates uh, 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 
uh, still operating not not as with, with the same configuration but uh, in in 2019 it was operating with these four levels of of, of turbulence observation 3 6 14 and 30 meters so i i had data from these two classical experiments flaws and cases flaws i showed already and case 99 is the one from the plot by jalon soon more of them have turbulence observations in different levels and this is important because some of the external parameters that we are trying to address are, 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 are thermal say the thermal soil thermal properties they are very site dependent so when, when we started doing this this study here we had to compare data from different uh, different places and i think this is crucial in, in boundary layer studies in general so we have these three sites unfortunately the picture from the tower which was supposed to be here is not i don't know why but uh, it's a 30 meter tower with uh, in, at this time four levels of turbulence observations so I will not go in a lot of detail, but based on that idea that the vertical gradient of TKE inverts a shift sign at the transition, we use that to determine how the, at those three sites, how the uh, wind speed threshold for regime transition depends on net radiation because uh, we have a very precise criterion to define that we could split the data by net radiation and that criterion still works for smaller chunks of data i can go in more detail if anyone wants but i will move to the results here but i, I can detail it if, if you need it after the the seminar or whenever just come for me when you do that this is our refine for the three sites, Santa Maria, Cases, and Floss. The, um, the wind speed, uh, that is the threshold for regime transition, increases of net radiative loss. So when, you, when you, the surface is losing more energy, you need stronger winds, which is reasonable. Uh, but what's interesting that we didn't know, this increases, except in the lower, values of net radiation seems to be nearly linear with uh, net radiation at the three sites here. More than that, the slope of the relationship is site dependent. You see, you have a much smaller slope in Santa Maria than both flaws at cases. At flaws, a little bit larger than cases, but they are very close to each other. Interesting here, uh, if you take only the uh, only the long wave radiation from the atmosphere, which would be represent an idea of cloud cover, right? Not nothing very clear happens, but then we, with net radiation, very clear pattern emerges. Please. Okay, uh, this is for the entire data set, and we take uh, 10 classes of net radiation for each. So this is average over one, each, is, is, each one is the average for one tenth of the total data set, regardless of if it's for the same night or not. Very good question. <laughs> So, um, interesting enough, this slope that that, that uh, the slope of the, the the threshold in speed by net radiation relates very well with CV, which is the volumetric soil heat capacity. Okay. You see that uh, the slope is about half. For Santa Maria than for the other two, and the relationship of the volumetric heat capacity is also about the same. Okay, might be a coincidence. I I, I don't know. This is actually one of the things that I, I, I'd like to to do here. I'd like to do a very detailed study to check that. 
and we need observations on different places with very good uh, representations of the soil and, and things like this. Uh, we do not think this is a coincidence, and we have uh, an explanation for that, which will come next. So some relevant questions. First, why? I think this, this one is a kind of easier response, easy answer. Why does VR, VR is the threshold wind speed, increase with net radiative loss? Second, why is the increase linear? And third, why does the slope increase with the heat capacity? The simple explanation for the first question is it's more stable when you have more radiative loss, then you need more winds to intense winds to uh, to break that stability. However, if you think only in terms of that, it does not explain three. Because if that's true, when you have some, uh, larger heat capacity, the soil cools less with the same radiative loss with larger risk capacity. So it becomes less stable. Then, it, then the slope would be smaller for larger heat capacity, and it's the other way around. So we need an alternative explanation. So the alternative explanation is in the stable regime, it, it does not contradict the, the first one, but uh, the explanation goes beyond the first one. In the stable regime, the net radiation is tied to the heat flux. So I, I, let's simplify and say that a constant fraction of the net radiation is the heat flux, you say a constant Bowen range or something like that. That's in the weakly stable regime because that's when the, the wind speed is supplying uh, is, uh, the energy for the heat flux to be a constant fraction of the net radiation. Uh, therefore, larger heat flux is necessary to transport back to the surface the energy that was radiative loss, as I mentioned before. And you need stronger winds to return the net radiation to the surface. Explain, uh, explains the first question, okay. But now, if you have larger heat flux, it means that the surface is cooling less, as, as before. Uh, as before. With the surface cooling less, it means you have smaller gradients between the su surface and the, the air near it. So to have the same heat flux with smaller gradient, you, mean, you need stronger winds. So that, that explains why stronger winds will happen under larger heat capacity. That explains question three. How about question two? Why is the increase linear? Well, it will, it uh, checks, it is explained if the heat flux increases linearly with the mean wind speed in the weekly stable regime. We have observations. This is from a site, from a tower that we had in, in the coast where the transition was very sharply determined. So we could do statistics in the weekly stable and very stable, very precisely determined. And the statistics in the very stable is the blue. In the weekly stable is the red. What you can see here is, at least for this site, very close to linear. The heat flux with the, the wind speed in the weekly stable regime. Is that in other places too? And now I, I'm gonna, this, this is no longer that 21 paper. This is something that I've been doing Afterwards, there are some words here that it translates to Portuguese automatically. And most of them I changed, but some of them I missed. Um, um, I added one tower from Ferdigão, which Petra was part of it, uh, from Ferdigão experiment. It's a 20 meter tower at the bottom of a valley. Um, so when we, that's the green dots here for Petigon. This is heat flux in terms of wind speed for all for, for all uh, okay for all uh, all experience, all data sets. But then if if you if you filter the data by cases when the top to bottom temperature difference over the tower is le uh, smaller than one degree, which means it, it is mixed in the far experiments it seems to be close to close enough to linear dependence. 
So that would explain why the net radiation, the regime transition varies linearly with net radiation. I'm getting close to, uh, there's so much I'd like to show. When you compare net radiation and the temperature difference, this temperature difference that I just mentioned, something very strange happens, at least for me. And I have to say that I asked many people. I, I asked, I, 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 I will say some of those. I asked. I asked David Jerome, my former advisor, and I asked Larry Mart, what do you expect to happen with temperature difference when uh, radiative loss is large? And both of them said, what I expected to, when you have lo lots of red large radiative loss, it should be, have large temperature difference. Maybe you don't have the same expectation, but I was not wrong. At least I felt I had the same same uh, expect, uh, expectation uh, as them. Why I ask that? Because that's not what data shows. The data shows that when you have large radiative difference, you have small temperature gradients near the surface. In all, all four experiments, maybe not so at Perdigon, but even at Perdigon, it's, it's there. You see? And why is that? The thing is, we, we tend to think as radiation as driving the show, as running the show. So you, ha you have lots of radiative loss, you cool the surface, build a, you build a large gradient. But how can you have a large radiative loss at the surface? You can only have a large radiative loss if the surface is emitting a, a lot of radiation. And for the surface to emit a lot of radiation, it has to be warm. And it only gets warm if it's mixed. So these are all cases, large radiative loss at the surface at night only happens when it's well mixed. This is something that we learn. And then when you compare net radiation to the mean wind speed, you see that very clearly, again, not as much as in, in Perdigon, but in the other three, you only have lots of large radiative loss if the winds are above a given threshold. And if you put here only data with reduced temperature gradients, you have this. You can see that uh, it's almost like there is a minimum wind speed for which you have mixing. And it seems to vary. At least for Santa Maria and Flaws, where the data sets are large enough, kind of linear with net radiation. So that you can, build, you can make this line here. And if you compare the average wind speed to the average net radiation, you get this, which you might recall is very similar to this from the, from the 2021 paper, except that this here, it's only comparing net radiation and wind speed. There's no turbulence observation. And this was based on a new method to compare the vertical gradient of turbulence and so on. I have to apologize here, but the, the colors for flaws and cases are switched. Here, cases is red and flaws is blue, and here, cases is blue and flaws is red, but they are exactly the same in the three. And of course, there's no perigon here. Perigon has the smallest, because it's in the bottom of a valley, the smallest wind, uh, wind transitions, uh, sm smaller uh, wind thresholds for the transition. So based on that, we try to generalize this idea and say that uh, the um, wind speed threshold for regime transition can be a CS, which we are calling coupling strength, which would be a coefficient, site dependent, then the, obviously the, the log of the height times the, the net radiation, linear, linear dependence. And the, slope would be the coupling strength, which would be site dependent. Depend Based on the first idea, does that depend only on heat capacity, soil heat capacity? I don't think so. I think soil heat capacity might be important. We have that indication. But the fact that in Perdigon, you have the smallest uh, slope of all, we have no idea what the soil heat capacity is. Maybe it's just a, a smaller heat capacity there. But I think that it's not. You, have, you are in the bottom of a valley, it's accumulating cold air, so naturally you already have large gradient because you have cold air going there, which means that you already have 
a good uh, surface to air temperature difference, you need smaller winds, you do not need uh, very strong winds to, to, to set the, the transition. If that is correct, that means that the CS, the coupling strength, it's not only thermal uh, properties, it, it, it's a bulk of features that include uh, topography, include thermal properties, uh, not roughness because roughness is already accounted for in here, but uh, maybe something else that we are not thinking, uh, have not thought about yet. Um, Edra Souza was a master student that we had. She was not my student, she was a student of a colleague, but she defended just before I came here. And she looked at over 100 data from FluxNet. FluxNet reports both wind speed and net radiation. It's perfect for us. And of the near 100 that she, she analyzed, I think about 70% had this the, uh, confirmed that as the net radiation increased, the mean wind speed increases linearly too, as far of this here there, there are big. So uh, we, we do not know. It's very hard. Very few of the of the um, stations report on roughness. Even less report on uh, heat capacity and so on. So we do not know if the slope relates as we are expect. But we do know that this behavior is consistent. It's not everywhere. About 30% of the stations didn't show that. We, some of them will have a, an idea why, some of them we don't, but in most of the places, this behavior appears. Uh, I said I, I was going to show some, some modeling. This is, this, uh, I'm just going to go very quickly here, but uh, we, we do try to model this regime transition too. Uh, Rafael Maronese was my student, he was my doctorate student. These two first papers here are from his thesis. And this one here, which uh, I put a question mark here because I did this before Saturday. It, it was just, a, it was accepted Saturday. I just got the acceptance from Mondelez Meteorology. So the, 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 the three tell a story. This here is a simple, very simple column model, simplified column model. He sh uh, Rafael showed that if we introduce prognostic equations to heat for the heat flux and temperature variance, the representation of the of the Hawking stick improves. Here, Rafael looked at different boundary layer schemes uh, in, in WERF and found that many of them do not reproduce very well. Like the Meloyamada Janji here that has a minimum turbulence, very fixed. Others have fixed minimum turbulence here. These ones have warming, that uh, counter gradient flux that warmed the the one that resembles best is Meloyamada Nakanishinino 2.5. Uh, resembles the, the hockey stick from Jello. Uh, and then the, the new paper is Rafael introduced, he, he built a, a, a scheme to go in morph. And this scheme, as predicted by, by the first paper, solves heat flux and temperature variance. No, none of the schemes available in WERF solve the heat flux. There are some that solve the temperature variance, but without solving the heat flux, these are the Mallory Amadna Kanishinina 3. It creates uh, some confusion in very weak winds. And uh, Raphael's model seems to be very good. Of course, it has to be tested 3D. We do not have yet uh, a good uh, coupling with the convective part, which uh, is a problem for becoming operational and so on. There's a lot of problems, but seems to be going in the right direction. Uh, I might be in the, I, I, that's when I got to the convective part. I'm gonna show very briefly, try to, to allow for questions, some convective boundary layer results. This is, I, I'm not going this is, would be the, the turbulence regimes in the convective part, but I'd like to show some data from the Amazon. So one question that I, I am asking here, can we extrapolate the linear flux profiles from the towers to infer 
CBL thickness. We had this tower, this I had mentioned briefly, this tower, this is at the coast, it's a 140 meter tower with 11 levels of turbulence operated until 2018, where it works beautifully. If you extrapolate the, the flux observations, you can get a good estimate of the CBL. Can we do that? I, I'm not going more detail, I'll just go and ask. We have the now operating the 325 meter tower in the Amazon, which is at atmospheric tau tower observatory, which is this tower here. Uh, I've been involved with the tower since the, its conception. And we do have now flux observations. Uh, it's running the observ the, the measurement starting in 2020. I'm kind of confused. I think it's 2022. Oh, 2021. We have more than a year of measurements now. Uh, so, not, it's not so simple as in that other tower, but I want to point out two things. This is one day, this is one day with, with very not many clouds, which is very rare in the Amazon. This happens once in a month at most. Uh, but we, we got this day here. And we have, I want to point out two things. 8.30, uh, you can see, I cannot see here, but you can see, I think you can see better than I. 8.30, which is this one here. You see how nice you have the, the, the flux going here? And you can see, you can see in the tower, the entrainment layer. Very, very nicely, I, I think. It's, it's, it's beautiful and it's consistent. So we have observations of the entrainment. We can have observations of the entrainment rate, at least in the beginning of the morning. And as it goes on in this very clear day, you can see here, you can ex extrapolate. If you extrapolate this here, it, it will give you uh, an estimate of the model layer near a thousand meters, which agrees with the with cilometer observations that we have in sight. Uh, another day, it's not that bad. It's more a little more cloudy. Again, you can see the entrainment layer beautifully here. You also can see that for heat uh, for latent heat flux and for CO2, except that you have only one point here. For some reason, there's not enough likers here. We we are taking, we are, inst we are installing so, some more, actually some that came from, from our tower in Santa Maria, we are sending them to the, to the, to have at least one more point here, to have uh, CO2 and uh, latent heat uh, in, in this area with more details and have the entrainment rate for those two but again you can see the uh, extrapolate here not too bad now when it's cloudy it gets much more messy much more complicated but there seems to be some relationship i have a postdoc which is luis gustavo martins maybe he will come in stay some time with us here in, in september uh, or about that uh, and uh, but uh, Luis Gustavo, he, he is a postdoc in the in the project now, and he is doing the, some composites for both cloudy and cloudless days, and there seems to be some consistent relationships. I will try to finish here, uh, and this is Mauricio here, Mar Oliveira here. That's Mauricio. Um, he before actually before he came to OU when he was applying to come here. He had finished his master, and I also had a. Uh, uh, it was not a postdoc because he was not a doctor, but uh, I had a, an assistantship available at the Atto project. And he took that and he did this very nice work, which got published when he was here, actually, in the end of his stay here. But it was developed before that. He looked at, in this paper here four events of. That's where I'm getting. And, Gonna close with severe weather, uh, four events of severe weather to find how they they showed up in the tower. In the uh, this is an atto, but it's before the 325 meter was operating fully. This is with, uh, at this time we only had observation until 80 meters. Okay, but you can see this the wind speed at the events, the, the temperature drop in the, during the outflow here of the 
on the axon, and I think it is a very nice. You see the heat flux evolution has a very clear signature. Uh, it goes negative, then a positive, and negative again. Okay, we, we can explain that. Uh, I'm not going uh, as, the, as the evolution of the air along the event. After that, uh, this is Lucas Oliveira. Lucas Oliveira is Maurice's brother. That's the same last name, obviously. This is Pablo Oliveira, not related to either, just the same last name. <laughs> uh, uh, Lucas uh, analyzed with the help from Maurice 10 convective events at Santa Maria. That's in the Santa Maria Tower, which is extra tropical. The other one is in the Amazon. And you can see here a very similar structure of the heat flux, the dipole here, positive, negative. And you, but the, then you, you can see the, the vertical structure too, because this is when we had 12 levels of turbulence in the 30 meters of the tower in Santa Maria. So we have a very detailed, even though it's not as deep as in the, in the Ato Tower. And this here, Pablo Rivera, unrelated to, the, to this is another student of mine who did uh, this study of Go Amazon data and he ran a single column model and he got this. This was even before Maurice's study. We, we got this observation. So when Maurice found that, we were very happy because we have the same structure here solved by a single column model. Why do I, am I show the, showing this to you? It's because this is where I say severe mutarine. It's very, very, and I'm concluding here, it's very common, people say, monio Bukov similarities constrained by limits of stationarity, and therefore obser the observations losing their derivations are limited to typical conditions. You, you, usually you have, uh, you discard data that are not uh, very continuous turbulence, and, and most of the, the relationships that are in the models uh, came from this. When I say yet they are using the models, yet would not be, obviously this is what goes in the models. You gotta use the, the trustable data. But my point is yet they are using models to simulate those severe weather cases, which and the data that came from them are not from severe weather. And why I'm saying severe meets severe? Because the, when I I had these conversations with Mauricio and Maurice. Mauricio said to me, we got to get this data to, the, to try to build these relationships because whatever goes in those relationships is not from these cases. I said, listen, Mauricio, this is exactly what I say when I, I try to justify studying very stable boundary layer. We got to use those data because no, nobody uses that for, to build the relationships. So it goes full circle. And the same reasoning goes for both, both uh, extremely opposed types of events. So I'm going to close with this. I'm going to mention that I, three things that I think could be done with me here and that I would love to develop here. The first is very clear in the stable boundary I already mentioned, to, to have this experiment where we deploy turbulence radiation, uh, soil uh, sensors in different sites, and really get a grasp of that variability between stable uh, boundary layer regime transitions with the purpose of trying to see if, if we can get the relationships based on external variables. I think that would be very useful for the models if the models, the parameterizations are based on external, external rather than internal parameters. That's the first thing. And I think we have the basis for doing that. Second thing relates to the severe weather events. Uh, for instance, uh, Lucas looked at 10 events. Mauricio at first looked at four, but now he's again working in this data. He has more than 100 convective events from the same site that he's uh, working on. And there are many others. We could maybe try to do development of parameterizations for severe weather events, but to do that, we need to get data from different places. We cannot uh, restrain ourselves to one given place of observations. And then the third point, this is actually something I talked to Jose Fuentes uh, just last week. I think based on that, either for the severe weather or, or for the other, one thing that I've been realized is that 
we need multi-site observations. We need because we need to generalize the, uh, how the variability plays a role. Maybe, for instance, in our the, the site that we had in Santa Maria, it operated two full years, 21 and 22, with 12 level of observations, two levels of the full radiative uh, budget, very detailed soil observations. All this data is available. I'd love people to, to use this data, and my colleagues there would love them. And the same, I think, I talked to Jose, I talked to other people. There are many data sets available there. Maybe we can build a network of turbulence observations for people to do that, to do studies, not looking at a given site, but looking at generalized uh, studies. The Flux community did that with AmeriFlux and FluxNet. Maybe, the, of course, it's much more difficult to do turbulence observation because we have to store raw data for our case. But, but now disks are not so, so bad, not so expensive. Maybe we can do that. So these are three things that I think we could do with that. Thank you. Um, I also, uh, Jamie's office uh, fourth floor in our business suite, uh, and all the content information is available in the portal, uh, but we do have just a couple minutes left here for the community in the room or online as a question. Um, please feel free. And that's right. I'm going to ask uh, maybe a somewhat provocative question. <laughs> you, you mentioned that you were, were interested in, um, in finding relationships to external control and, and um, that net radiation could be one of those external controls. But, but then in your discussion, you highlighted that the net radiation is actually influenced by the turbulent mixing. So do you still consider it to be an external control? No, yeah, that's a very good point. We have in that paper one sentence that clarifying that net radiation is not an external control. No, yeah. uh, it, 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 and we, but it gives you an assessment on an external variable, which is the, the cloud code. It, it, it depends. Uh, and the, when and the, the interesting thing, when I saw that second plot, when you look at downward long wave, which would be much more related to net radiation, that has no relationship at all. So the. Net radiation is really controlled by how much the surface. Yeah, is yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so w w our first assessment maybe would would be this: you have the linear relationship. You so our our, our idea is if you if you have an an idea of what the slope is for a given site, then you can you, you have at least a good idea on how to assess the the transition at, at a given site. Yeah, but then it's based on that radiation, which has a degree of internality, which which would not be desirable. But and still, it's better than other quantities such as heat flux or Z over L, which are fully full. Even in terms of measurements, I'm not saying that radiation is easy to measure, but somewhat easier to measure than some of the other two. Yeah, and uh, exactly. And uh, you have more, uh, it's more available than the two plus data. Yeah. And, and, and then you, you got to see what the models do. That's that's the idea in, in the end. I don't, I, this is something that we haven't done, but how well does the model reproduce, uh, can tell the net radiation based on this dependence that it does have on internal variables. Maybe maybe it's, there is a problem there. We need to. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the uh, the transition regime to the boundary layer. The humidity and moisture play quite an important role. Never mentioned the engine. Yeah. What do you think about the transition 
Yeah. Uh, well, for one thing, uh, I don't think that's what you are talking about, but the uh, uh, soil moisture might be important, of course, but that would, would be, that would go together in that coefficient, except that that might, might cause more variability. Of course, that needs to be addressed. Uh, as for the atmospheric humidity. It's almost heat flux and moisture flux can be. Yeah. Opposed. That's true. The transition is really the special. Yeah, the, 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 uh, I think all, all of this we are treating as, maybe as a simplification that the boiling ratio is constant, that you have a fixed, a fixed fraction going to sensible heat, a fixed fraction going to latent heat. If it's not like that, Sure, it, it will cause then it, that will linearity in the relationship will, will form. So it, it's a simplification, it's an assumption. And it might explain why in some sites the relationship does not hold. That's a good point, actually. If the because it, 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 the whole idea that of the linear relationship is based on the idea that a fixed fraction of the heat flux. Is going for the for the a, a fixed fraction of the net radiation is going for it. If it's not, then the relationship will not be linear. I don't have a question. I have a comment. To your number three, I think I can speak for the people in here. If you get out fit flux measurements that all of the Mesonet towers we would erect a statue here on them. <laughs> well it locked <laughs> I, 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 I do not uh, I, I, th I think that would go to number one actually that's yeah. that's that's the idea but I'm not thinking on all of them I'm thinking maybe six seven eight uh, at some point yes I'd love to <laughs> But, but I would need help with that. <laughs> I will write the proposals for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Octavia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.